Hi, I'm Matt Chandler here, pastor of the Village Church. Just want to thank you for streaming uh, this sermon uh, on your device. Uh, I, I wanted to, just before we get going here, uh, just lay before you a deep conviction we have that this video sermon uh, that we've prayed really stirs up your affections for Jesus and shapes you and molds you into the image uh, of the Son um, would just be supplemental to your relationship with the Lord and in no way would replace the church you should be plugged into or the pastor that God has put over your life to shepherd and care for your soul. And so please uh, enjoy the next hour or so uh, of this message. We have prayed that God would use it in a profound way in your life. Blessings. Hey, how's everybody doing? Well, excellent. If you, that's always so awkward. Uh, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and grab them. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, we're going to start in verse 1. This is uh, week 2 in, in just a two-week series on prayer that we've just called He Hears. And, and so we're going to uh, talk a little bit about um, some, a couple of different things uh, this week than, than we talked about last week. So, so last week we talked about um, how prayer kind of operates between these two poles of praise and petition. And so uh, we, we praise God in praying and, and then in that praise of who he is and what he's done, uh, we can at times by the Holy Spirit become convicted and so that leads to confession and then that confession uh, leads to cries for help and for God's to intercede on our behalf and so then, then prayer just continually kind of bounces back and forth between praise and petition. And so we talked about that last week and then we spent time praying with one another and for one another and in this place. And it was good kind of um, that, that idea that, that prayer uh, has to be caught more than it's taught, that we know we should pray. Many of us even know how to pray, but we can't quite seem to know why we don't pray like we want to pray. Uh, and so what I thought we would do in our time together today is simply look at what, what I think are the biggest hurdles to a robust, deep, vibrant prayer life. If it is true for most Christians, many Christians, that we would like to pray more than we do, that we would like to spend more time with God than we currently are? What are the hurdles that keep us from consistently and deeply communing with God in prayer? Uh, and so the, if we're going to tackle that, if we're going to talk about that, I think what we need to do is have uh, just a brief, um, very brief um, kind of overview of the gospel, what we believe as Christians, really the, the root of what makes us Christians? And if we can look at that, then I think we can get to the bottom of kind of these hurdles that kind of keep us from the type of prayer life that we would like to have. And so um, if you have your Bible, Ephesians chapter 2, 1 through 10, if you memorize scripture, I would just encourage you that these 10 verses and in these 10 verses is so much uh, of just a clear definition of what the gospel is. Now the, now, the word gospel means good news. And like I said, it is the root of what makes us Christians. Christians. Belief in what I'm about to read and in what we're going to briefly talk about is what makes us believers in Christ. Belief in what we're about to read. Ephesians 2, starting in verse 1. First four verses have to do with us. The last six verses have to do with God. So let's start with us. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passion of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. So we can just stop there. Now this is true, fundamentally true about everyone in this room, that everyone at one time was this. Many of you in here even now are still this, but for those of us who are Christians, this is what we once were. It is not what we now are. But if you're not a Christian, have not professed faith in Christ, then, then very much so you're, you're in this. You, you couldn't read this and say you were, but, but you could read this and see where you're currently located. And so let, let's talk about this. The, the first thing that, that he says, and remember, we're just doing a gospel primer here, is that we were dead in our trespasses and sins. Now, now this isn't some sort of kind of ethereal, uh, a gaseous kind of statement. It's not like this. Uh, I, this is on the ground that you and I have been 
in active rebellion against God. We, we followed, according to this text, uh, the way of the world, the way that seems right to man, but in the end that leads to death. You, you and I have followed that, and, and we followed the, the prince of the power of the air. Maybe unknowingly, but we gladly did it, that, that you and I bought into the lies of the fallen, broken nature of the world. We gave ourselves over to them. So one of the ways you can see that in our modern culture is every little aspect of restraint or repression is now looked upon as the greatest infringement on your freedom and your happiness when throughout human history, the opposite has actually been true. That restraint and repression has actually led to better life, greater life, richer life, more enjoyment of life than than no rules. I do what I want. I decide for me. So we bought into that. Every one of us bought into that. We gave ourselves over to that. And and the Bible says um, that this is sin. You, You and I gave ourselves over. We were born sinful. We gave ourselves over to sin. We have been rebellious against God, and therefore, uh, we are objects of God's wrath. So, so everyone in this room at one point was an object of God's wrath. And I know that's so unpopular and widely debated. In fact, even a lot of those who would call themselves um, evangelicals would argue that, that God can't have wrath and he would never be wrath. You see this oftentimes as, you know, uh, God being a God of love. And, and so I've tried to press on this in my 13 years with you now that, that love and wrath coincide. If you have love, wrath is present. It's impossible. Like Because I love my children the way I do, if you tried to harm them, right? Uh, if you, you tried to hurt them or take them or something like that, I would feel wrath and that wrath would be born out of my love, out of my love for them. In the same way, the reason God has appointed wrath towards those who rebel against him is out of the well of his love love, his love for his name and the glory of his name, but also his love for those of us who will become children of God. So we've all rebelled. Have we done that? We have thought we're smarter than God. Uh, According to this text, uh, we steal and get all the credit for good. Um, we, We tend to generally flaunt our rebellion in front of God as though he did not exist and did not care. Uh, And one of the ways I think you can most consistently and easily see this is if you listen to people talk, Um, people will blame God for everything bad and take credit for everything good, right? So anytime anything bad happens, they're like, well, if God existed, why would this? But anytime good happens, they're like, nailed that. I did great at that, right? I mean, this is just a clear indication of flaunting rebellion against God. And so the Bible tells us that God has made us objects of his wrath because of that rebellion. Again, everyone in this room, because you're not born a Christian, has at one point in their life been brought forth in iniquity, is a sinner, has rebelled against God, and had God set his face against you, right? This is the gospel. And I know some of you are like, I thought you said good news. Okay, we're, remember, we're just talking about you, right? We're gonna get to the good news. Uh, and and that's, that's where we see now, starting in verse four, we're gonna start hearing about God's response to that. And, and here's God's response to this. Look in verse four. But God... If you write in your Bible, I would circle, highlight, do whatever you do there on those two words. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God and not a result of works, so that no one would boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And so so we see that, that you and I are dead in our trespasses and sins. We are objects of God's wrath. We flaunt our rebellion in front of the most powerful thing in the universe. And God's response to this, even with his wrath present, is if you look to what this says about the character of God, that being rich 
in mercy and having a great love with which he loved us, made us alive in Christ. Like, like how crazy is that moment? That's why the gospel is good news. We're stuck in our rebellion. We're stuck in our sin. We are isolated and far from God. We are by our nature flaunting rebellion against one who can destroy not just the body, but the soul. And yet God's response is what? Out of mercy and a deep love for us, to make us alive together in Christ. And that's where in th this phrase, in Christ, is, is where life comes from. And, and so just to really just kind of simply, again, this is just a gospel primer. You can talk about these things at length, but our purpose today is to set this so we can get to hurdles of prayerfulness. Um, what we see happening in this exchange, and, and I talk about this all the time here, so if you're a consistent attender, this will sound uh, like every week here, right? Uh, which is, Good news that we cover the good news every week, right? And, and so uh, in, in the end here now, Christ comes and he lives a perfect life, the, the life that you could not live, that I could not live. He lives for us, perfectly righteous, never sins, upright in God's eyes. And then he goes to the cross. He is beaten severely, nailed to the cross. And the Bible tells us that the wrath of God, that as you were an object of God's wrath, God takes that wrath and he pours it out on the Son, pours it out on Jesus, and Jesus absorbs that wrath fully until it is all gone, which is why Jesus says it is finished. And so then in that marvelous exchange, after the resurrection and the ascension, we are by Grace alone, through no act of our own, received by faith alone, through no act of our own, made alive together in Christ. And that's the good news of the gospel. That, that's why we proclaim it and go, no, 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 there's good news. And so it's so interesting to me that so, so many people like stay on the bad news. I can't believe God is bothered by that. No, no, the good news is, no, no, he's made a way. He's come and he's saved. He's opened up a door. He's laid down a bridge. He's invited you into eternal life through Grace or by grace through faith. No act of your own. You don't have to clean yourself up. You just get to come. It's an invitation to be washed clean. It's stunning. And then on top of all of this, he, he plans on showing us, according to the text, the immeasurable riches of his grace and his kindness in the ages to come. So since our God is infinite and eternal, the sheer amount of kindness and riches of his grace are immeasurable. So it's not just in this life that we begin to walk and experience those riches, but it's in the life. It'll take ages, right? Eons to experience the fullness of God. And that's why I don't know if you kind of ever thought about heaven and start thinking about eternity and get a little wigged out about what's actually going to be going on 10,000 years from now. But since God is an inexhaustible well, what this text is trying to communicate is you'll never grow weary of the experience of the fullness of God. Now, that's hard for us to imagine here because we'll get tired of any experience here on earth. But God is so deep, so beautiful. The, the riches that he possesses are so immeasurable that it's gonna take the coming ages for us to continue to experience these. In fact, it'll take forever. So, so why, why and, and actually one more thing here that, that I think it's important, not, not only do you get to experience the immeasurable riches of his kindness and mercy towards you, his grace towards you, but, but then on top of that, the, the Bible says that in his unique wiring of you and unique placing of you, you get to be a part of good works that he prepared in advance for you. So, so this is what's great. I think people will read this text and go, okay, now I'm saved, well, let's do good works. But, but really, it, it appears that the good works have been created and now you'll walk in them. And, and I think that's a better way to read this text. I think it reads better that way in the original languages. And here's something to consider. However God's designed you, wired you, and placed you, you're gonna have the opportunity to be faithfully present. So if you're a lawyer or a businessman or a, a teacher, an educator of some kind, if you're in the domain of ag, whatever domain government, whatever domain of society you're in, you're now set up to do good works where you are. So you don't have to go looking for them. They're right in front of you. They're in your home. They're in your neighborhood. They're in in your workplace and you've been set free now to pursue these things for the glory of God. It is faithful presence that Christians become the salt and light of the world. So now why, why do we need to walk through the gospel again if we're going to talk about prayer? 
Well, well, I think the major hurdles to a robust prayer life are tied to a misapplication of the gospel, and if not for a misapplication, a misunderstanding of the gospel. So I'm gonna invert those and, and start. I wanna start with a misunderstanding of the gospel. So how does a misunderstanding of the gospel affect our prayer life? He, here, here's the first misunderstanding. The first misunderstanding is that the gospel saves us but doesn't necessarily sanctify us. And, and so maybe, maybe I can, if, if these are words that, that you're not familiar with, sanctify and things like that, that's a very church word. Um, so maybe you think that the gospel kind of forgives your past sins but now you gotta clean yourself up. So uh, I gave my life to Christ. I became a Christian, and now I've got to work to stay saved. Well, that's a fundamental misunderstanding of the gospel and will totally rob you from a robust prayer life, right? Because this means guilt and shame remain. If you think of the gospel as it saved me past tense, but it's not saving me present tense and holding me into the future, that means guilt and shame remain. It means that although you would intellectually ascribe to what we read in Ephesians chapter two, you are not living as though you believe it. Right, Guilt and shame remain. Like, like oftentimes in conversations with people, here's what I found. They don't pray because they don't pray. Here's what I mean by that. They feel guilty because they don't pray, so they won't pray because they haven't prayed. Right? And, that, and that's silly, but that means guilt and shame remains. It means I've got to earn the right to pray to God by praying to God. But that, that's certainly not the gospel. The gospel says prayer is an invitation to inhabit God's space. That's what it is. Prayer is this invitation to inhabit God's space, right? That the judgment on your life has been done and you have been deemed spotless and blameless, so come. That's what the Bible means when it says approach the throne of grace with confidence. God's gavel has been banged concerning me. I am spotless, blameless in his sight. I'm not showing up dirty. I'm showing up clean by the blood of Christ. And it's in this misunderstanding of the gospel that so many of us are robbed from robust prayer lives. He saved me, he loved me, he was crazy about me, but now I'm just kind of a disappointment to him. Right, it's like your best days were in yesterday. It's just not how the Lord sees you, right? It's this misunderstanding. The second um, misunderstanding around the gospel is I think people have a tendency to think technically rather than relationally. We think technically rather than relationally. So, so we hear the gospel, we understand the gospel, we're still not thinking in terms of relationship with God. We're, we're not thinking in terms of, I've got a relationship with God, a, a, a relationship where I get to kind of spill my heart. In fact, it's the best relationship you'll ever have. What about my spouse? It's better than that relationship. He knows everything. There's never a moment in your relationship with God where you should ever hide from anything that's actually going on in your heart. Think how amazing that is. So you might be in a conversation with someone else and think, oh man, I could never let them know that. What would they think? Well, God already knows that. So no, there needs to be no pretense, no pride. He already knows. You can go, I hate this part of my heart. I wish I wasn't thinking like this right now. I, will you help me? And, and God's not appalled because he's not surprised. Right? You, you just don't have any secrets from him. He's the one relationship you have where there's nothing hidden. And he knows all and has not condemned you. So when Jesus says, come to me, when he uses the illustration of the persistent widow that just kept pleading until the judge came, he's inviting that prayer is an invitation to be relationally connected to God. Right? Come, sit, speak. He knows everything. And so I think those are the two big misunderstandings that the gospel saves me, but it doesn't necessarily mean that God and I are cool right now. I've got to kind of gauge how am I doing right now? Am I doing well? Am I not doing well? And then that's what leads to either prayerfulness or prayerlessness. And then there's also uh, a mi misapplication of the gospel. And so let me give you two of those and then I, uh, three of those. And then I want us to spend some time praying. Um, the, the first in regards to misapplication of the gospel is that, that God is sovereign over all. So why pray? Right, if God's sovereign, if God knows everything, if he's already made up his mind, then, then why should we pray? Well, well a, a couple of things on that. that. What the Bible teaches us is that God hears and he responds to his children. And there are some things, and, and this, is, you, you, this is from the, the scriptures, there are some things that God has sovereignly decreed would be accomplished through the prayers of his saints. 
So, so God is going to accomplish something, and, and he's going to accomplish that through the prayers of the saints. So he invites the saints, invites you and I to pray because he's going to accomplish these ends. And so just uh, as illustration, and I don't want to spend too much time here, but um, when, when I was diagnosed with cancer, and then they were like, hey, you got two or three years um, to, to, you know, to live. We're going to poison you for 18 months of that, so um, let, let's get busy. And, and really, th- there were two types of, of people on the prayer spectrum um, that, that really, in a, a real way, caused a lot of consternation in my own heart. Uh, the first was that if I just had enough faith, I would be healed, um, w- which biblically is ridiculous, don't have enough time to unpack that right now. I think faith is involved in that, but it doesn't guarantee anything. And then there were others that are like, well, if it's the will of God that you'd be healed, then you'll be healed, right? Now, both of those has, have smidges of the truth, but not the full truth, right? Like we clearly see in the scriptures that God's expectation is for us to pray for people to be healed, Right, So we want to ask God, God, heal this man, heal this woman, drive out this disease, repair their body. Drive, right? We're being called to pray that God would heal people. Right? And so we, we even said last week in last week's sermon, we talked about your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I, I don't think I'm going against that right now. We want God's will to be done, but we don't know what God's will is regarding um, prayers for healing. So we're going to pray with open hands, knowing God is going to accomplish what God is going to accomplish. But maybe by his grace, he has determined that he's going to heal this person through our prayers. And so we want to beseech him and bother him and plead with him to do that and and he's never bothered by us bothering him. That's awesome. That's a misapplication of the gospel. And then, um, then again, I think we can get to navel gazing. Uh, I can't do it, and God knows I can't do it. Now, here's what I want to, so this misapplication of the gospel that I can and God knows I can't, that in and of itself is a prayer, right? And this is where understanding the gospel ushers you into prayerfulness. When you understand the gospel, even that I don't know how to pray becomes a prayer. I don't know how to pray. Help me learn how to pray. And then lastly, and then I actually want us to pray. And this is the one I think that's broken my heart the most over the years. And I think it's birthed out of really bad teaching. Prayer doesn't work. I've tried. So I've come across quite a few people that had this season of their life or this moment of their life where just with tears wetting the ground, they just begged God to do something, begged God to accomplish something, begged God to make something happen, and it didn't happen. And so their conclusion is God doesn't hear us, God doesn't respond, God does not care. So Tim Keller, I heard Tim Keller say this once, and I want to say it to you, and then I want to usher us into some time praying with one another. Tim Keller wrote in a a book about prayer that if we knew all that God knew, we would answer all our prayers the same way he does. If we knew all that God knew and had all the facts and all in the span of eternity, if we knew what God knew, we would answer all of our prayers the exact same way God answers them. And so again, I, I just passionately believe that prayer, and and if you think about it, I mean, how often have you heard or read uh, about prayer and and you just kind of feel guilty in it because I don't, I think you can teach some technical aspects of prayer, but I think by and large, you learn to pray by praying. So we wanted to set aside chunks of time to pray, and so we're going to do that here. Now, I want to pray for us, and then we're going to begin to pray with one another for the next 20 minutes or so, okay? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for these men and women and that right now you you hear what I'm saying, that as infinite as you are, as loud as the universe is with suns burning and things exploding and all the reaches of the universe with all the noise on this planet, you hear my voice, you know my thoughts, you understand my heart and you delight to hear me cry out to you. And so we transition now to us as a congregation, as a group of your people, and and some here not your people who will pray that you will hear our prayers. We thank you for the gospel that we can boldly approach your throne of grace with confidence today. You're generous and good to us. We love you. It's for your beautiful name I pray. Amen. Hey, friends. So we're now going to respond to the message on prayer with praying um, and so what we do know is that, is that this, this context of prayer could be a bit hard 
and awkward for many of us. And so as Matt shared in his message, our hope and our prayer is that, is that we all would pray until we pray, that we would press past the awkwardness um, and, and intentionally engage the throne of grace. And, and so for some of you, this may actually be um, one of the first times that you maybe pray with your family. Praise the Lord, and that's okay. And so we want to enter into this time with humble hearts to plead and beg the Lord to do things that we can't. And so the points that I want us to pray about today is it's really coming from Colossians chapter 1. And so Paul writes something in verses 9 through 13 in response to the Colossians and their faith in Jesus Christ. This is what he writes. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will, with all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power, according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And so the first point that I would love for us to engage the Lord in is, is really this point that Paul brings out here is, is that in response to the faith of the Colossian believers, Paul says that he's not ceased to pray for them. And so I want us to, to really gather with our families, with our spouse, maybe with a neighbor next to us, and, and really pray that in response to the gospel, that we would have hearts that are postured in a way that we are unceasing in prayer. And so again, that is in response to the gospel, that, that we would really ignite with a passion of prayer that is unceasing before the Lord. And, and so that is we remember. We remember in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, that that we were dead in our trespasses and sins in which we used to live. When we follow the ways of this world, the ruler of the kingdom of air, the spirit who is at work in those who are disobedient, all of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and desiring its thoughts. We were by nature objects of wrath. And so when we recognize and understand that, friends, we were dead, We were apart from the family of God. We were separated from the light of Jesus Christ. May that provoke thanksgiving in our hearts, adoration to the Lord, and really launch us and ignite in our hearts this desire to be unceasing in prayer. Why? Because now we're invited to pray. And so, friends, let's pray, let's gather, and let's pray that in response to the gospel that we would have a heart that is ignited with a posture of unceasing prayer. Let's pray. So Father, I do echo the many prayers that are being prayed right now. And and Lord, I, I pray, God, that in response to the gospel, Lord, that we would have a life that is ignited with a flame and a desire and a passion to have a posture of unceasing prayer. Lord, that as we remember your invitation through your grace and sending your son, Jesus Christ, that our hearts will be thankful. And God, that we would respond in prayer often and more. And so Holy Spirit of God, would you help us in that? It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. And so one of the second things we see pulled out here in the context of Colossians chapter one is that, is that Paul says that, that he prays that they will be filled with the knowledge of God's will with spiritual wisdom and understanding. And and so why? Why is it that Paul would ask for them to be filled with God's will, with all spiritual wisdom and understanding? Well, the reason why is because that which we have been delivered from is also what we still currently wrestle with. And so as we have been delivered out of darkness, we have been freed from the bondage of sin, we still wrestle. We still wrestle with the flesh. We still wrestle with desires that are contrary to the spirit. And and so, friends, we need the wisdom of God, spiritual wisdom and understanding to discern the ways of the Lord. And so some of us here, even now, we're in a situation where we don't know what to do. And we don't know how the Lord may be leading. And 
And so we have an opportunity right now to pray and plead and ask the Lord to guide us, to give us his wisdom, to give us his understanding so that we may may be able to discern what he would have us to do and wherever we find ourselves. And so friends, let's pray for that. Let's pray that the Lord would, would really allow us to know his will, to have spiritual wisdom and understanding in order that we may navigate well throughout this life that we live. Let's pray. Father, I confess that I don't always, nor do I often ask um, for you to reveal your ways, that you would give me spiritual wisdom and understanding. And, and so, God, I pray that for myself, and I pray that for all of us here, Lord, that we um, beg of you, Lord, um, to show us, Lord, what you desire, um, to give us spiritual wisdom and understanding, Father, that we may be able to navigate um, throughout all seasons of our lives, looking to you to lead us, looking to you to guide us, um, God, looking to you in order that you will be glorified through us. And so help us, Lord, would you, would you help us to understand your will all the more, um, increase um, the spiritual knowledge that we have, Lord, in order that our lives um, may be lived out for your glory alone. We ask that, we plead that in Jesus' name, amen. And one of the other things that Paul brings out in this prayer is, is he, he says that he prays that they will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. And so I love Psalm 27, 4. David writes, one thing I've asked of the Lord, and this also do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire of him in his temple. And, and so that is when we inhabit the space of the Lord, we begin to look more like Christ, that our ways begin to not look like selfishness, like what we want, but more of what the Lord wants. And, and so when Paul prays that, that he prays that the Colossian believers will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, what he's saying is that the context in which they live in does not represent Christ, that there are people around them who live contrary to the gospel. And so he's praying that they will live their lives in such a way that the faith that they would profess would also be the lifestyle in which they live. And, and so family, may, may we pray to the Lord that we will walk in a manner worthy of the gospel, worthy of the Lord. And, and what that means is that we would not just say we believe, that we would not just say we have faith, but that we will be unapologetically and ferocious about the gospel in our own lives. And so let's pray that. Let's pray that people would not just hear Christ from our lips, but that they would see Christ in our actions. Let's pray to that end. Father, we do pray that we will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. God, that our lives would echo, God, the message that we profess, the gospel. Father, would you help us to live our lives in such a way, God, to, to where the message that we claim to be true, that we profess, um, God, would also be the way in which we live our lives. And so, God, would you reveal to us, Lord, opportunities where we may press forward, um, God, to speak truth, um, to share the gospel in dark situations, um, and God, to exude, Lord, the fruit of the Spirit, so we ask that, we plead that, Lord, that, that we would not just say we believe, but that God, our actions and what we do and what we think, um, God would represent the faith that we hold to in Jesus Christ. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. And then lastly, Paul would, would then encourage and pray for the Colossian believers um, that he would pray for power and strength, um, for endurance and patience and and so if I was to ask all of you here, how many of you need the power of God to sustain you when you're weak? Many of you would say amen. Yeah. And if I was to ask you, how many of you really need the strength of the Lord when you find yourselves in, in seasons of life where you're broken, where you're wounded, and where you're weak? Many of you would say amen. I need that. And if I was to ask you, how many of you need endurance and patience 
Because sometimes you desire and you want to give up because life gets hard. Sometimes you don't really know how to enter in and you don't want to enter in. Many of you will say yes and amen. I need that. And, and so friends, we want to pray now, lastly, that, that the Lord would give us his power, that he would give us strength, that he would give us endurance and patience. And, and his word is true when he when Paul writes in Ephesians 3.20, he says, Now to him who is able to do far more than we can ever ask or think, according to his power that's at work within us. What that means, brother or sister in the Lord, is that we all walk around by faith in Jesus Christ. We all walk around with the promised Holy Spirit of God in us. A power that can do far more than whatever we could ask or think. And so now we can ask the Lord for his power. We can ask the Lord for his strength. We can ask the Lord for his patience. We can ask the Lord for his endurance because we can't do it on our own. We can't. And so we're welcome to the throne of grace to ask the Lord to help us, to give us himself. And so wherever you find yourself, maybe right now you need the power of the Lord. Maybe right now you need endurance. Maybe right now you need strength. Maybe right now you need patience. Let's ask for that and let's pray for that. Let's pray. Father, we need more of you. God, we ask for your power. God, we ask for your strength. Help us to endure with patience. God, that the Holy Spirit of God would permeate from us, Lord, that, that we will be guided by your power, that we will lean on your strength that we would endure because it's you helping us to endure. And Lord, we need patience, God, a fruit of the Spirit. God, we ask for that, Lord. Give that to us, Father, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So friends, this is what was encouraging. As I looked out and I saw over a 1,000 people, heads humbly bowed before the Lord, petitioning that the Lord would do something. I think about the upper room discourse as the disciples of Jesus Christ and many others waited for God because he promised that he would come and he came. And when I think about revivals that's happened throughout our world, they all started with a posture of prayer. And so may today not be the only day that we linger in prayer, but as we're driving, let's pray as we're taking our kids to school, as we're laying our kids down at night, as we go to sleep at night, as we pray over our meals, let's use those opportunities to draw near to the Lord with this posture of unceasing prayer because we're invited to pray, to encounter him, to inhabit his space. Amen. So let's stand and let's continue to celebrate the Lord in worship.